Hello and welcome to Nursing School Explained. Today I'll be going over the major electrolyte, um, electrolytes in the body and as that pertains to patient care causes and also treatment options or nursing interventions for electrolyte imbalances. Now keep in mind I've written up their normal values for these electrolytes but always refer to your textbook, to your professor, or the hospital that you're working at um, to find out about their normal values and especially on what to know for a test. So generally, let's start with sodium. Sodium um, is a major extracellular um, electrolyte that helps us regulate fluid balance, hence it also helps regulate blood pressure and blood volume. It is regulated by antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone that pertains to the RAS system. I also have a separate video about the RAS system that you can refer to um, really understand how sodium fluid balance and potassium really interacts um, in, in the RAS system. Um, sodium always travels with water, hence blood pressure and volume are always regulated by both sodium and water. Chloride also is very much linked to sodium, so if the sodium will be low, typically chloride will be low. If sodium is high, typically chloride will be high too. That's why I wrote here, it travels with water and chloride. Now, whenever there is a sodium imbalance, think about neurological changes. So we have to be very diligent in assessing our patient for changes in mental status or level of consciousness. So these might include headache, irritability, confusion, and it can lead all the way to coma. Now, when the patient's sodium level is low, we want to give them normal saline, which is 0.9% sodium chloride, to replenish that sodium that they have lost due to whatever causes. We also want to increase the sodium in their diet to make sure that they replenish their sodium. And we could also give them hypertonic saline, which would be 3% sodium chloride, but only and really only if the hyponatremia, the sodium level, is extremely low, 120 or below. Refer to my video on basic fluid and electrolyte balance and the administration of hypo, iso, and hypertonic solutions and how that applies to fluid shifts. So hypertonic saline only if there is severe hyponatremia. Now if the patient has high sodium level, hypernatremia, then we certainly want to reduce the sodium in their diet and also give them isotonic fluids to kind of delete that sodium. Now you'll see that isotonic IV fluids are both the treatment for low and for high sodium. It'll depend on the severity on the level of the high or low sodium level and also on a lot of other factors as well as the rates that we're going to administer these IV solutions. And basically because sodium and chloride are so closely related, both signs and symptoms and treatment for sodium and chloride imbalances are pretty much the same. Now moving on over here to potassium and magnesium. You can see I have written those in the same column here and then I tried to color code it um, for blue for potassium and then black for magnesium. Again, general values up here refer to your textbook or professor regarding normal values as they pertain to you. So potassium is a major intracellular electrolyte. It helps us regulate the heart function and the neuromuscular junction. So think about sodium and potassium channels as the, it pertains to the contraction of muscle, whether that's the heart or skeletal muscle. Sodium, sorry, potassium is regulated by the kidneys. The kidneys exchange sodium and potassium depending on the pH and the levels and the needs of the body. And causes for high or low potassium can be GI losses such as vomiting, diarrhea, suctioning, or laxatives. Renal failure will definitely lead to hyperkalemia because the kidneys are unable to excrete the potassium. 
which can be very bad because increased potassium can affect the heart and can therefore lead to dysrhythmias. Medications that can affect potassium is digoxin. Digoxin is a heart medication, a cardiac glycoside, that helps strengthen the contraction of the heartbeat um, and is usually used for patients with congestive heart failure. Now, when there's just a slight abnormality in the digoxin level or the potassium level, it can cause some, some very significant um, disturbances or clinical manifestations in the patients. And diuretics as well can disturb our sodium um, and potassium because remember that diuretics help us excrete some fluids and they work on the kidneys by exchanging sodium and potassium. So if there's too many diuretics, depending if they're potassium sparing or potassium wasting, they can cause a problem with our potassium balance. Now, whenever you think about signs and symptoms of potassium imbalance, think about heart and muscle because that's what these two electrolytes are mostly in charge of. Dysrhythmias can be caused by abnormalities in potassium and magnesium, as well as weakness, and that pertains to mostly skeletal muscle weakness because we need it for the neuromuscular uh, muscular contraction. Now, treatment for low potassium as well as low magnesium would be IV or PO replacement. Now, again, depending on the severity of the hypokalemia, will be given the patients either IV or PO replacement. Now, I wrote here in red, the maximum IV administration rate will be 10 MEQs per hour. This is something that is very critical that comes up on a lot of exams. Think about your course exams as well as the NCLEX because if you give potassium too fast, again, it can lead to dysrhythmias and it can actually cause death in the patient. So 10 MEQs is the maximum rate per hour that potassium can be infused. And if the potassium is too high, then we're gonna give the patient diuretics, potassium wasting diuretics, that'll stimulate the kidney to excrete more potassium. And if that is not working, if the kidneys are not working, for example, in a patient with end-stage renal disease, then we'll have to filter the potassium out by means of dialysis. Now, magnesium pretty much, if magnesium is low, potassium will be low. If potassium is high, magnesium will be high. So these two like to travel together as well. Another major cause for magnesium deficiency will be alcoholism. And for magnesium, again, we're going to have to replace it orally or in the IV. And um, for magnesium, treatment if it's too high then we'll also if it gets really high have to put the patient on dialysis let's look into calcium and phosphorus imbalances so i've again color coded this here so calcium is written in black phosphate is written in green and calcium is mostly prominent in bones and teeth as we know but it's also important for muscle contraction for the heart as well as skeletal muscle. Not quite to the extent as potassium and magnesium are, but it's also very important in the function and the actual physical contraction of muscle. Now calcium and phosphate balance are regulated by, parathy by the parathyroid gland, which are four small glands that sit behind the thyroid gland in front of the neck. The parathyroid gland's function is to balance a calcium and phosphate in the body. And important to note here that calcium and phosphate have an inverse relationship. So if calcium is high, phosphate will be low. If calcium is low, phosphate will be high. This is in contrast to sodium and chloride because if one is high, the other one will be high and low the same, they, they will travel the same direction. And then potassium and magnesium, same thing applies. So if potassium is high, typically magnesium is high. Potassium is low, typically magnesium will be low. 
where calcium and phosphate, they have this inverse relationship, so they basically travel the opposite direction. No signs and symptoms of calcium imbalance, weakness, fatigue, kidney stones. If there's too much um, calcium in the system, the kidneys can't filter it out, and that calcium gets stuck in the kidneys, causing kidney stones. Most kidney stones consist of calcium oxalate, hence here's the relationship. Increased calcium can also lead to tetanus, which is basically uncontrolled muscle movement, and also dysrhythmias because it has an effect on muscles, specifically the heart. Now then, um, with calcium imbalances, these two, these two signs always come into play, which is Schwarzbeck and Trousseau. So when there's an imbalance in calcium and you strike the patient's uh, cheek or side of the face with, with just very slightly with the finger, it'll cause some contraction of the facial muscles there. Where Trousseau sign is if you place a blood pressure cuff on the patient and you pump it up, you inflate it, it will cause some spasm of the fingers of the same arm that that blood pressure cuff is attached to because of that effect on the muscle. Um, calcium is also always mentioned with deep tendon reflexes. So whenever the calcium level is low, it'll lead to increased deep tendon reflexes. I know it's a little bit counterintuitive, but if the calcium level is high, it'll lead to decreased deep tendon reflexes. So you would check a patella reflex and then see if it's a plus one or a plus four to judge if it's increased or decreased deep tendon reflexes. Now treatment for low calcium is the same as for high phosphate because they have this inverse relationship. And typically if one is low, the calcium is low, phosphate will be high. So if we have low calcium, we're gonna increase the calcium in the diet. We'll also increase vitamin D because vitamin D is needed to actually absorb calcium. And if it's severely low calcium, then we'll do IV replacement. For um, high calcium and low phosphate will decrease calcium in the diet, will increase weight-bearing activity, and what that means is that the calcium that again we measure in the patient's bloodstream only is moved from the bloodstream into the bone because the bone with weight-bearing activity needs that calcium. If the calcium gets really high and we can't get it out any other way, we'll have to put the patient on dialysis to filter their blood and help them get rid of that excessive calcium. Now again, for low calcium, also means that the phosphate is high. That means we're gonna limit phosphate intake and supplement the patient with calcium carbonate, which also will increase the calcium in their diet. If the calcium is high, phosphate will be low, so we'll be increasing the phosphate in their diet and maybe replace it in the IV. Now, a very common cause of very high phosphate level is renal failure. Because when the patient uh, has renal failure, they will build up very, very high levels of phosphate in their system, and that's usually seen as what's called uremic frost. So the phosphate will actually build up in their skin and if you've seen somebody who's been on dialysis for a few years, their skin will be very flaky, kind of gray, and almost there will be crystals coming out of the skin, and that's usually indicative of hyperphosphatemia. So in summary, sodium and chloride travel together. Think neurological changes in the patient. Potassium and magnesium always travel together. Think heart and muscle. Magnesium specifically, think alcoholism. And then calcium and phosphate have this inverse relationship. Schwarzig and Trousseau sign applies as well as deep tendon reflexes. And then treatment for hypocalcemia is the same as for hyperphosphatemia. And same for if they're high and low the other way because of this inverse relationship. So I hope this cleared up some of the um, electrolyte imbalances that we can have in the body and how they are treated. Thank you for watching. Please leave comments down below and let me know if there are any other topics you would like me to review in the future. I'll be happy to address those.
Thank you for watching Nursing School Explained.